This video is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Get access to their entire catalog of engaging video lectures for free at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash nerdsync. Wow, paint. So I know that in this day and age, it's kind of an annoying trope to revisit Spider-Man's origin story over and over again, so much so that the MCU has so far just skipped over it entirely because they had the confidence that we all knew the basic story. Spider-Verse even played into the gag that this story has been overdone, opening the film with... All right, let's do this one last time. My name is Peter Parker. I was bitten by a radioactive spider. I'm pretty sure you know the rest. That being said, I think it's worth going back and taking a look at the very first telling of Spider-Man's beginnings, his original origin, I guess. All the way back in Amazing Fantasy number 15 from 1962, because it is secretly brilliant. From the emotional and powerful writing penned by Marvel legend Stan Lee to the strange insanely smart and even creepy artwork drawn up by Steve Ditko, this story that tells us the dawn of Peter Parker as Spider-Man is perhaps the perfect comic. And here's why. <laughs> oh, hi there. How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here. I'm certainly glad you could join me today. What do you say you get your brushes all warmed up and let's do a nice little painting today? I think today we're gonna do a, a nice little painting about Spider-Man. I like Spider-Man. He's a fun little critter. Readers who picked up Amazing Fantasy 15 would open to the splash page of the comic, introducing us for the first time to Peter Parker, who will soon become the hero Spider-Man. The comic reads that costumed heroes are a dime a dozen, but we think you may find our Spider-Man just a bit different. Arguably the most significant factor that made the webhead stand out was that he was a teenage superhero. Before Spider-Man, superheroes were almost exclusively adults, and if there was a teenager, they'd be relegated to the role of sidekick. Not only did introducing a full-fledged teenage superhero give younger readers a character that may have been easier to relate to, I mean, that was literally the entire point of other heroes having kid sidekicks to begin with, but this also allowed Stan Lee the opportunity to infuse even more emotion into the story. I mean, take a look at this. Held within the very first page of Spidey's very first tale, we see Peter Parker's love for his Aunt May and Uncle Ben, the pride he takes in his studies, the rejection and humiliation he faces at the hands of his classmates, and the seeds of his vengeful ego. Someday I'll show them. Someday they'll be sorry. Sorry they laughed at me. Later on, when Peter gets bitten by the radioactive spider that gives him superpowers, you can see how this scene makes excellent use of a Dutch angle where the camera is a bit tilted off axis, adding a sense of tension. Something strange has just taken place. When Peter goes outside to get some air, he jumps toward a building to dodge a speeding car and discovers that he can stick to walls and scale buildings. A young kid sees Peter climbing up the side of a skyscraper and tries to tell his mom, but she just thinks her son is making it up and has watched too many horror movies. Now, Steve Ditko was, in fact, famous for drawing horror comics and incorporated elements of eerie suspense in the webhead's early stories. He drew spidey and creepily contorted poses with a slender, elongated frame, which differed from Marvel's other star artist, Jack Kirby's style, who tended to draw heroes in a more muscular, squared off frame. Author Sean Howe compared and contrasted these two artists' styles in his book, Marvel Comics, The Untold Story. Unlike Kirby, whose heroes had a stocky majesty, Ditko populated his stories with rail-thin, squinting malcontents, placing the protagonist, Peter Parker, in a constellation of sneers, jabbing fingers, and angry eyebrows. Additionally, Mike Benton elaborates on this a little bit more in his book about the history of horror comics. Ditko's abnormal characters clawed their way through stories filled with spiderwebs, registering fear, shock, and surprise at even the barest hint of horror. His stories were scary regardless of what he drew. This 
subtle element of Ditko's horror art is present throughout his early run on Spider-Man comics, and I think it's an essential part of the character that he must haunt your dreams like a vengeful spirit. If you're interested in learning more about that aspect of Spider-Man, I made a whole video that goes into detail about his horror roots. You can click right on up there to watch that, my friend. But for now, I think we gotta beat the devil out of this. Peter quickly decides to use his newfound powers to make money by entering a wrestling match with a beefy, muscly boy named Crusher Hogan. And the composition of these panels is just fantastic. When Peter first steps up to the ring, Ditko draws him lower in the frame than the triumphantly posed Crusher who is large and imposing. But once the match starts, we get this brilliant panel finally showing who's really dominant in this showdown. Spider-Man is now above Crusher physically, and Ditko keeps that composition for the remainder of the fight. You can also see that before this moment, Spider-Man is to the left and Crusher is placed on the right of the scene. This panel then serves as the turning point of the battle. For the rest of the fight, Ditko draws Spider-Man on the right and Crusher on the left. It's a complete swap in composition from the start of the wrestling match to the end to visually show how the tables have turned. But this turning point is also clever for another really cool reason. It's the only panel in this entire comic that doesn't have any dialogue, any narration, or any sound effects. It's silent. And this little detail wasn't some happy accident, or as I call them, mistakes. No, Ditko knew that silence was very important, very important. You see, the introduction of any element of sound gives a panel an approximate length of time that it lasts. If someone speaks, the panel only lasts for about as long as it takes for them to say what they say. If there's a sound effect, like say, the nice soothing sounds of brush strokes against a nice white canvas, then the panel only lasts for as long as that sound effect reads. But as Scott McCloud writes in Understanding Comics, when the content of a silent panel offers no clues as to its duration, it can also produce a sense of timelessness. Because of its unresolved nature, such a panel may linger in the reader's mind. The quiet nature of this panel makes it a standout, impactful moment of this comic. We can imagine that as Spider-Man shows Crusher who's really in charge, it not only catches Crusher off guard, but the audience as well. A hush falls over the crowd, and so too does silence fall upon us readers. It's a thrilling moment that leaves the audience quietly stunned. some killer ASMR right there. Later on in the story, Peter develops web shooters and a full bright red costume to perform on TV in to put more cash into his pockets. But one day, as he's leaving the studio, a thief runs by him. A cop chasing the criminal down yells at Spidey to help and stop the burglar, but Spider-Man doesn't get involved. He lets the thief pass him by. Sorry, pal, that's your job. I'm through being pushed around by anyone. From now on, I look out for number one, and that means me. And just look at how Ditko makes use of frames within frames here. Spidey is always kept separate from the thief and police officer by those vertically dividing lines in the hallway. This visually signals that Spider-Man sees himself as entirely independent and isolated from the events of the crime. He's not getting involved. He's staying out of it. And these dividing lines Ditko threw in helped drill that idea in even further. And we can't discount the dialogue that Stanley wrote for Peter, which makes it clear that what matters to him the most is whether or not he can directly benefit from a situation or relationship. For instance, every scene with Aunt May and Uncle Ben, the two people that Peter loves most in this world, shows them pampering their nephew with food, more food, and that microscope he's always wanted. That seems like a pretty sweet deal. Peter reflects to himself, they're the only ones who have ever been kind to me. I'll see to it that they're always happy, but the rest of the world can go hang for all I care. I mean, what a frustrating, 
superhero. Even when Peter does vow to use his powers for the benefit of others, it's only because those two specific people have been kind to him. His motivations are still wholly selfish. Contrast that with, say, the Fantastic Four, who debuted a couple years before Spider-Man. Once the team discovers they have superpowers, the very first thing they do is vow to use those powers for good, to protect the world. This isn't unlike Superman, Batman, The Flash, or other heroes of the time either. Altruism was just kind of the default mindset for super protagonists during these days. But with Spidey, Stan Lee introduced a superhero who was utterly self-serving, a moody teenager who was so fed up with how the world treated him that once he was granted great power, his first thought was, how can I use this to benefit me and only me? I think that's something people gloss over a lot with Peter Parker. He, he wasn't this kind, wholesome, nerdy misfit in these first comics. He was very intentionally a dick and almost certainly an incel. <laughs> and Stan Lee purposefully set Peter up like this to fall. And he fell hard. One night, as Peter Parker is headed home, he notices a police car parked in front of his house. And notice here how the panel that sets up the scene clearly shows the calm blue night sky. But as we jump to the next two panels, when the cop tells Peter that his Uncle Ben has been shot and killed, the background color rapidly changes to a bright red and then quickly to a vibrant green. Now color can play a fantastic role in your painting. If you haven't invested in a gallon of phthalo blue, well, you're dead to me, friend. Now on a traditional color wheel, red and green are opposites. They're complementary colors. When placed next to each other, they make the colors pop out and catch your eye. Ready? Are you watching? You gotta make the sounds or it doesn't work. Now let me ask you a question here. Have you ever wondered why there are so many green Spider-Man villains? Green Goblin, Vulture, Lizard, Sandman, Doc Ock, my beloved Fishbowl Boy. It's because their green costumes all visually contrast the bright red tights of Spider-Man. The complementary colors add a, a striking juxtaposition that, that really grabs your attention. So having back-to-back -back panels with one flooded with red and then shifting rapidly to green in the moment when Peter learns that his Uncle Ben has been killed by a burglar is almost certainly meant to make this part of the story pop off the page. Modern recoverings of the story go for a more consistent approach with both panels being lit up red by the police lights, but they achieve this same color contrast by having the previous page almost entirely lit in green. The effect being that you see all this green and then turn the page to see all this red and you still get that clash of complementary colors. It's meant to feel visually jarring the same way that it must have felt emotionally jarring for Peter to learn that tragic news about a person that he loved. You know what I'm gonna love? How about some nice happy little clouds right down here? And once again, we observe the medley of emotions that Peter experiences through Ditko's art and Stan Lee's dialogue. Peter is stunned and heartbroken to learn about Uncle Ben. His grief turns rapidly into anger as he demands to know who the killer is and where they're hiding. Spider-Man is fuming with rage as he tracks down and confronts the man who murdered his uncle. This final sequence of the comic makes incredible use of scale and perspective to dramatically enhance the visual storytelling. Spider-Man hunting down Uncle Ben's killer is depicted as a genuinely terrifying scene as he looms over his enemy in the composition. By drawing Spider-Man looking down on the killer below, Ditko is visually showing how Spider-Man is in control of this scene. Peter is literally, physically above this criminal. Okay, so he's like a hero, but he's above the, uh, that's good, I wonder, if the, I wonder if there's a word for that. That's a joke for all of my etymology friend. <laughs>
But while this blocking makes Spider-Man look more powerful than the criminal, even towering over him in some shots, Ditko's artwork hardly makes it feel like Spider-Man's actions in this scene are heroic. The panel right here makes me feel almost scared for the killer. Spider-Man, frankly, looks far more threatening than this guy could ever be. If we again go back to that modern recoloring, we can see just how menacing Spider-Man looks in this scene, hearkening back to Steve Ditko's days in horror comics. But, uh, as we all know, directly following all of this action, Spider-Man finds out that the man who murdered his uncle is the same thief that he let slip past him earlier. Peter's rage morphs into shock, guilt, and shame. He no longer feels big and powerful like he did moments earlier. His mask is pulled back. He's not an all-powerful superhero. In this moment, Peter Parker is merely a human who has suffered through an unthinkable tragedy. My fault. All my fault. If only I'd stopped him when I could have. But I didn't. And now? Uncle Ben is dead. Stanley's dialogue really shines throughout this final chapter of this story. It feels so raw and powerful. In the book, What is a Superhero?, Stan outlines why creating characters with realistically complex emotions and relationships was vital to how he crafted superhero tales. I try to make the characters seem as believable and realistic as possible. The contrast between him and his powers and the normal world is one of the things that makes the stories colorful and believable and interesting. Stan Lee loved playing around with the disparity between a character's superhero side and their human side. And this panel merges those two aspects together in an emotionally resonant scene. Peter openly weeps in a closed off pose, holding his head in his hand. It even looks as if he's slowly backing out of the frame, trying to take up as little room as possible. Ditko takes this idea to a powerful conclusion in the final panel of the story. He pulls back the camera, drawing Spider-Man walking off towards the horizon. No dynamic pose, just his head hunched over as he disappears down a shadowy street. The buildings and the moon tower over him to emphasize the attack on Peter's ego. You think you're big and important? You're not. You're a tiny, insignificant speck, not even worth more than a handful of squiggly pen strokes. The story ends on an iconic passage penned by Stan Lee that beautifully and poetically closes this chapter of Spider-Man's life while instilling the grand thesis that has been enshrined upon nearly every iteration of the character. And a lean, silent figure slowly fades into the gathering darkness, aware at last that in this world, with great power, there must also come great responsibility. All of this beautiful artistic storytelling happened in just 12 pages, by the way. But they were 12 compelling, and brilliantly crafted pages. There's a reason why this story has been told and retold countless times over. It was done so masterfully the first time around, and every iteration has been trying to capture that magic ever since. But you know what I think the best Spider-Man origin is? I think it's the one that you like best the one that speaks to your heart, whether it is this first one in the comic or another retelling from the comics or one from the movies, cartoons, whatever. It's a story that resonates with so many people for so many reasons. And I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about the first time that it was told. Now, if you excuse me, I think I'm almost done with this painting. I have one final brush stroke to do, and it'll be complete. There. I think we'll call this one finished. See, painting is easy, 
You don't have to sell your soul to learn how to do it. But you could though. You could sell your soul. I'll take it. I'll take your soul. I'll take your soul! Okay, but seriously, I love doing these artistic breakdowns of comics because it helps show exactly what I preach here on this channel. Superheroes are impactful, and comics are important art. And learning how to read and interpret art can help immeasurably with your understanding and enjoyment of it. And I've personally been picking up some new ideas and knowledge through today's sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is a collection of over 11,000 engaging video lectures that will teach you everything about anything. Science, history, photography, cooking, even how to draw. They have a series that I've been watching in preparation for this video specifically uh, called How to Look at and Understand Great Art that goes into topics of color, line, perspective, uh, the use of time and motion. That's especially helpful when analyzing comics as a sequence of images over time and space. Basically, it's a great series. Highly recommend it. Each course is entirely self-paced with no homework, no tests, no stress. Although if you are a nerd like me, uh, you will still be taking lots of notes. Uh, the people you'll be learning from are Ivy League award-winning professors and experts from trusted institutions like National Geographic, the Smithsonian, the Culinary Institute of America, the Mayo Clinic, and more. So go to The Great Courses Plus, choose what you want to learn, and stream your courses anytime on any device, your phone, your laptop, your tablet, your TV. I'm making a lot of lists here. And it's all completely commercial free. And for a limited time, you can access the entire catalog of The Great Courses Plus for free at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash nerdsync. Once again, that's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash nerdsync. Link in the description. And thanks so much for watching. If you like these comics art analyses videos, uh, leave a like so I know to keep doing them. And while you're at it, subscribe and hit that bell so you can watch more of my definitely very good and not at all silly videos. Uh, if you want to be extra great, consider supporting me on Patreon. I want to give a huge thanks to Christopher Lang, Laurie Timms, Billy Bombs, Everett Parrott, Havelock Smiggles, It's Quintly, Jonathan and Megan Pearson, Jonathan Lanowski, Sonali Manka, and the rest of the wonderful nerds who support me over at patreon.com slash nerdsync. Link in the description. Click or tap right here to learn about how Mysterio changed my life. That's not a joke. I tell a whole story about it in that video. Or click right here to learn why Spider-Man and Doctor Strange make the same hand gesture. Once again, my name is Scott, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. See ya. This wig is dumb and I hate it.